and thank you for joining us for a discussion on enhancing cybersecurity readiness in an era of digital disruption with Shelley Bruce, Chief of the Communications Security Establishment. My name is Aaron Schull, and I'm the Managing Director at CG. It's a pleasure to have you with us. The digital economy is a fundamental pillar of the modern world, a catalyst for increased connectivity and innovation that continues to evolve and drive economic growth, prosperity, and technological development. However, today, the digital world is more fragile than ever before. There is a proliferation of complex cybersecurity threats that are increasing in number, magnitude, and sophistication. Intellectual property is being stolen from companies at an alarming rate. Foreign actors are meddling in our elections through fake social media accounts and other more nefarious means. And more and more critical infrastructure is being digitally enabled and therefore capable of being digitally disabled. And governments and companies around the world are falling prey to digital hacking schemes. On top of this, COVID-19 has acted like a thematic lure or subterfuge for malicious cyber threat actors to exploit vulnerabilities, stressing the importance of cyber readiness and resilience as a national imperative for enhanced stability within the digital ecosystem. A long overdue reappraisal of Canadian strategic approaches to national security will have to emerge in the post-COVID-19 environment. This is why CG recently launched a major new research project aimed at reimagining a Canadian national security strategy for the 21st century. It will consider a range of both traditional and non-traditional threats and the interrelationships between them, as well as the ways that Canada can influence global policy and rulemaking to better protect future prosperity and enhance domestic security. It is in this context that I am absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker, Shelley Bruce. Shelley was appointed to the position of Chief of the Communications Security Establishment in June 2018. Shelley joined CSE in 1989 as a linguist and intelligence analyst within the SIGINT branch. After a series of roles in SIGINT collection, planning and policy in IT security and as executive assistant to the Chief CSE, she served as Director General Access and Facilitation and Director General of Intelligence. In 2007, she was seconded to the Security and Intelligence Secretariat at the Privy Council Office as Director of Operations and also as Deputy Afghanistan Intelligence Lead Official. Between 2009 and 2017, Shelley was Deputy Chief at CSE, responsible for Canada's National SIGINT program. With this vast range of experience, Shelley is imminently qualified to discuss enhancing cybersecurity readiness in an era of digital disruption with us. And we're so pleased to have her join this important forum for a sophisticated dialogue on national security issues, but one framed within the Canadian context. As a procedural matter, this event will be recorded and posted at cgonline.org for future viewing. Please also do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any time throughout the event. And I promise we will do our best to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Chief, it is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Shelley, over to you. Hello, and thank you, Aaron, for that introduction. As Aaron said, my name is Shelley Bruce, and I'm the Chief of the Communications Security Establishment, the most important government agency you've never heard of. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. According to a recent survey, when given a description of our mandate, only 3% of Canadians could name CSE as the government agency in question. More than 80% hadn't a clue, and 11% thought we were CSIS. For most of our 75-year history, that would have suited us just fine. But things are changing, and I can tell you with some degree of certainty that you'll be hearing a lot more from CSE in the future. But I'll get to that in a minute. First, we need a short primer. Who are we and what do we do? CSE is Canada's National Cryptologic Agency. That's an erudite way of saying code making and code breaking. And that in turn is an oblique way of saying that CSE has a rich history of foreign signals intelligence and communication security dating all the way back to the Second World War. What began as a signal corps in support of the British war effort quickly became joined up military and civilian signals intelligence operations. By the end of the war, the Canadian intelligence efforts had exceeded all expectations and demonstrated just how effective and important these capabilities could continue to be in the U.S. Commonwealth Partnership in the emerging post-war era. 
Formally established in 1946, the Communications Branch of the National Research Council, or the CBNRC, became that cryptologic agency. And in 1975, the CBNRC was renamed the Communications Security Establishment under the Department of National Defense. And that means that this year, we are celebrating 75 years of national leadership as Canada's Foreign Signals Intelligence Agency and Communications Security Agency. And while the government's priorities have changed to keep pace with the issues of the day, and while technology has changed beyond recognition in the last three quarters of a century, the bedrock of our mission has not. We continue to provide an information advantage to Canada's decision makers and to protect nationally important systems and information. We're very proud of the work of our cryptologic predecessors, some more well-known than others for the work that they did in responding to real world events and in laying some important foundations for computer science, mathematics, and artificial intelligence. And that's why you'll hear more from CSE in the future, because there's a direct line from our traditional stock in trade to the challenges that Canada faces today. Today, we live in a cyber world, and that's CSE, CSE's wheelhouse. And our people are at the very center of that wheelhouse. Today, we have brilliant engineers and mathematicians, code makers and code breakers, linguists and analysts, we also have researchers, computer and data scientists, software developers, cybersecurity and malware analysts, and reverse engineering specialists. And they're supported by other talented teams across the organization who are also dedicated to the mission of keeping Canada and Canadians safe. We are technical to our core. We are dedicated to continuous innovation, and we're committed to diversity and teamwork because the problems we face keep growing in complexity and we need those different perspectives, skills, and mindsets to tackle them. CSC's thought leaders continue to trailblaze modern day solutions for Canada, just as their predecessors did. So that, in a nutshell, is our history. It's who we are and what we do. But just one more thing before we dive into the discussion on cybersecurity readiness. I'd like to take a moment to reinforce the importance of our foreign intelligence mission. It's really hard to convey just how much CSE has had to innovate over the past seven and a half decades to keep up with the dynamic global communications and technology environment. But we have, and we've maintained our solid track record of providing information about the motivations, intentions, capabilities, and activities of Canada's foreign intelligence targets. And today we continue to deliver unique timely and useful foreign intelligence regarding global issues, crises, and events that affect Canada. Our foreign intelligence also helps protect and support deployed can Canadian military missions. It helps Canadian security partners disrupt terrorist and extremist threats to Canada, as well as to counter espionage, foreign interference, and transnational crime. There's one thing we've discovered over the years. It's that just like everybody else, traditional threat actors are taking advantage of today's cyber environment to support and advance their activities. These wide ranging foreign intelligence insights are important for government decision and policymakers on a day to day basis, but also in the context of today's specific conversation. It should come as no surprise to any of you that our foreign intelligence program also sheds light on global cyber threats whether they're state-sponsored or criminal, as the people behind the keyboards assess their opportunities, craft campaigns, and exploit systems to gather our secrets, our intellectual property, personal and financial data, to extort money or to position themselves for more malign, more disruptive purposes. So now that we're all caught up and properly acquainted, let me get to why all of these foundations matter when it comes to cybersecurity in the 21st century. Canadians have always been early adopters of technology and we're very comfortable online. The pandemic has only reinforced and accelerated that trend. Today, we consider this kind of Canadian technological embrace a distinct national advantage. It underpins Canada's prosperity and competitiveness, and it also affects Canadians' quality of life. Just imagine how we would have coped during the pandemic without being able to live and work online the way we did, the way we still do. But while there are benefits to be gained from adopting emerging technologies and being plugged in, we're reminded every day about the risks they carry. Risks to our privacy, our economic security, even our personal safety and physical well-being. I'd like to give you a quick tour of the cyber threat landscape as we see it, and then I'll talk about what CSE is doing to help mitigate those cyber risks. 
The bottom line and spoiler here is that the threat and risk surface is growing and the slate of players looking to exploit both human and technical vulnerabilities is also growing. Our aperture of classified, sensitive, and open sources tells us a few interesting things. First, we know that cybercrime is the most prevalent, most pervasive threat to Canadians and to Canadian businesses. Online fraud, ransomware exploits, the theft of personal data, these are big business. And with cyber threat actors selling their tools and skills online, you don't even need technical expertise to be a cyber criminal these days. It's a full service industry and one that even features help desk support. Critical infrastructure and large enterprises are the most lucrative ransomware targets because they are the least able to tolerate operating delays or disruptions, and they have the deepest pockets. But we also know that state-sponsored threat actors are probing Canada's government systems and our national critical infrastructure, such as the electricity grid, for their own strategic intent. To be clear, without international hostilities, we don't think that state-sponsored actors would choose to turn the lights off in Canada, but you can be sure that they're seeking these capabilities for when and if they need them. And as the operational technology used to control critical infrastructure and industrial systems becomes more internet connected, the threat surface expands and becomes more complex. And we all know that with increased complexity comes increased risk. Cyber threat actors of all kinds are interested in Canadian intellectual property. They target startups, businesses, academia, government departments, research organizations. They're targeting those with, with valuable information that can be used for financial gain or strategic advantage or both. For example, during the pandemic, we saw cyber actors zero in on vaccine research organizations in Canada. Widespread systematic commercial espionage robs Canada of its innovation edge to the detriment of our future prosperity and our competitiveness. State actors also seek to influence political discourse, to sow so discord, and to undermine trust in democracy by spreading information on an industrial scale. This is no longer limited to election periods. It's a constant, ongoing, global phenomenon. And even if Canada is not at the specific crosshairs of a directed campaign, the interconnectedness of our global information spaces means that we will feel the collateral impact of these efforts. So these are just a few examples, a snapshot of the threats we face. If you want a comprehensive overview of Canada's cyber threat challenges, I highly encourage you to read Canada's CSE's 2020 National Cyber Threat Assessment. It's available in all good bookstores now. I'm just kidding. It's available online and it's free at cyber.gc.ca. So cybersecurity is not abstract. Cyber systems, digital systems, they do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in relation to people with real world implications for their privacy, their prosperity, their well being. And I know this all sounds a bit dire, but the good news is that we can all play a role in offsetting these cyber risks and creating a Canadian culture of cybersecurity. Here's what CSE brings to the table. There have been a couple major developments over the past years that have helped position us to be a more effective leader in this space. The first came in 2018. This Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity was created, bringing together decades of mission expertise from across the gov federal government and uniting it under one roof as part of CSE. The Cyber Centre has an outward facing role with a mandate to work with industry and academia to raise the cybersecurity bar across Canada. They are the ones who write the National Cyber Threat Assessment. The Cyber Centre website is packed with foundational cybersecurity guidance as well as specific technical advice aimed at different audiences. Again, cyber.gc.ca. I highly recommend that you check it out. To give one topical example, the Cyber Centre has been particularly focused over the past year on pandemic related cyber matters. We work in partnership with Canada's health sector on this, alerting them to threats, offering specific indicators of technical advice, hands on assistance, and cybersecurity training. And right now, the Cyber Centre teams are helping to protect the vaccine rollout from cyber compromise. The second major development was the overhaul of our governing legislation. In 2019, Parliament passed the CSE Act, a mutually reinforcing multi-part mandate that positions us to help address Canada's cyber threats. 
part one is foreign intelligence. I've already mentioned that we're the national authority for foreign signals intelligence, meaning that we target, access, decode, and analyze foreign communications in response to the government's intelligence priorities. Part two, we're the national technical authority for cybersecurity, meaning we can provide cyber defenses, not only for the federal government, but also for designated non-federal systems, for example, in national critical infrastructure. Part three, we can conduct foreign cyber operations, meaning we can take action online to defend and advance Canada's interests in cyberspace. And CSE is also mandated to use our technical expertise to assist federal partners, including the Canadian Armed Forces now, to conduct cyber operations under their own mandates and in line with their own authorities. This avoids replicating costly capabilities across government. CSE's integrated legislated mandate was designed to discover, detect, identify, respond to, and ultimately help deter cyber threat actors. Our authorities allow us to work with a broad range of partners with whom we can amplify our unique technical and operational value. So where do we start? Cyber threat actors need three things to be effective. Motivation, capability, and opportunity. Our job is to degrade one or more of these variables in a way that undermines their overall chances of success. So for CSE, the first order of business is to raise the domestic cybersecurity bar. This might also be called the best defense is a good defense. We must make Canadian cyberspace a harder target. We must raise the costs to those who want to access our information and our information systems. We must build a national culture of cybersecurity collaboration based on strong partnerships and best practices. And when things go wrong, we must respond swiftly and effectively. As a federal government agency, we started a couple of decades ago by turning our attention to the systems that were in our own backyard. And today, CSE Cyber Center works closely with government partners at Treasury Board and Shared Services to safeguard Canada's federal networks. CSE's learned a lot over this time, designing and operating extensive arrays of network and host-based sensors to protect the sensitive information that resides on these systems. Every day, we block billions of cyber actions against departments and agencies that are within the protective perimeter. Our defenses are fueled by artificial intelligence and are constantly refined based on what we learned day in and day out. This is how we protect Canada's secrets, our research, our intellectual property, and the personal data of Canadians. So the federal public system is well protected, but what about the private sector? The CSE plays a broader national role. We take the unique knowledge that we acquire from federal censoring and from our classified foreign intelligence operations, and we incorporate those insights into our public threat assessments and our practical guidance and support for Canadian business. We publish alerts and advisories when urgent information is required, like in the SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange cases. We've built strong international partnerships over decades that have created trusted foundations to allow us to share both technical and threat information. We also share indicators of compromise with private sector partners whenever those can help bolster the defenses of those who might be targeted. And we share tools and solutions that we've developed in-house. One of these, a malware analysis and detection tool called Assembly Line, has been downloaded about 3,000 times by leading Canadian and international companies. And now we're seeing cybersecurity experts and open source developers around the world building on it and making it even better. We work very closely with our domestic partners in the telecommunications, energy, finance, transport, and especially this past year in the health sector. We've helped to raise the bar for those fighting the pandemic, whether they're in government, hospitals, health research, universities, or part of the vaccine development and rollout. We also take what we learned through our mission and apply it to make the internet safer for Canadians. At the national level, our threat feed is incorporated into Canadian Shield, a free downloadable app from the Canadian Internet Registration Authority that blocks users from inadvertently connecting to malicious websites. Since it was first offered a year ago, more than 20 million malicious domain connections have been blocked by Canadian Shield. We're also making it harder for malign cyber actors to spoof Government of Canada domains. 
Since last March, we've worked with private sector partners to remove over 7,000 malicious domains that were posing as official government sources. This has been especially important during the pandemic. The Public Health Agency of Canada webs and websites related to the Canada Emergency Response Benefit were among the most frequently impersonated domains. This has helped reduce the risk that Canadians will encounter misinformation, be defrauded, or be lured into phishing campaigns to steal their information. And then there's our Get Cyber Safe campaign. It's an ongoing program offering rock solid, easy to implement cybersecurity advice in an informal way that sometimes borders on cheeky to try and get people's attention. The ultimate goal of Get Cyber Safe is to arm 38 million Canadians with the basics so they can take up their place as Canada's frontline cyber defenders. Check it out on social media as well. You'll see what I mean. So these are just a few of the examples of how we're trying to raise the bar domestically so that the costs to cyber threat actors are high enough that it makes them think twice before they take the effort to exploit Canadian targets. But Canada doesn't exist in a vacuum, and even the best domestic posture needs to consider Canada's place in the global cyber context and as part of an international community of like-minded countries who are committed to an open, secure, safe, accessible, and inclusive internet. So if our first goal is raising the Canadian cybersecurity bar, our second goal is to create stability and predictability in global cyberspace. How do we do that? Well, Canada has been working now with international partners to set parameters around what is considered responsible cyber behavior and then promoting those parameters as agreed upon cyber norms. CSE supports our colleagues at Global Affairs who are leading this particular effort along with multilateral groups and allied partners and who are developing Canada's international cybersecurity strategy and our diplomacy initiative. Setting normative behaviors is vitally important. It positions Canada and others to respond when our national interests are threatened by what we consider irresponsible cyber behavior. Our response can draw from a wide range of traditional measures, including diplomatic interventions or even public attributions. Over the past several years, we've not shied away from calling out irresponsible cyber behavior when we believe those actions have crossed lines. But of course, Canada must not just advocate for, but we must also respect those evolving cyber norms. Parliament gave CSE a mandate to use our technical capabilities responsibly in cyberspace beyond intelligence gathering to protect and advance Canada's interests in the area of international affairs, defense, and security. And that includes taking action to disrupt irresponsible behavior online. These authorities and the activities that are conducted under them are really important tools in Canada's toolkit. But we must make sure that they fall clearly inside the parameters of normative behaviors in cyberspace. The CSE Act reinforces Canada's position on what constitutes reasonable proportionate behavior in cyberspace. And that's aligned with international law as well as Canadian values. Canada's foreign cyber operations must respond to broader government of Canada priorities. They must fit within the limits prescribed by law and policy, and they must be authorized by the Minister of National Defense in consultation with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's not appropriate, obviously, to speak of specific efforts here, but it's worth noticing that, it, that our foreign cyber operations are subject to review by independent external bodies. So when we take all of this together, these efforts, raising the bar, defining normative behaviors, and setting an example to, in cyberspace, all of these can help improve Canada's cyber readiness and our digital resilience. They won't entirely eliminate motivation or capability or opportunity, but they will introduce new barriers and raise cautions that will deter some threat actors. And ultimately, this will allow us to focus on those who are most determined to get what they're after. So in closing, let me say this. CSE is committed to helping Canada protect its information and its national critical infrastructure. And we're committed to creating a secure digital ecosystem for Canada. Our mandate positions us to see threats, to prepare for them, to block them, and to respond to them, and over time, hopefully help deter them. Our culture of innovation and experience our diversity and our expertise are shaping our 
approach to this mammoth problem. But CSE alone cannot do this. Government alone cannot do this. This is a whole of society concern and it requires a whole of society approach. In every one of today's examples, you heard about the partners with whom we work and through whom we amplify our unique value on a national and sometimes international scale. And that's why CSE is opening up in so many new directions to continue building those partnerships. And that's why hopefully Canadians will come to understand who we are and what we do. In some ways, it's still a little bit outside of our comfort zone. But on the other hand, helping Canada and Canadians be safer through pathfinding innovation and technical excellence, well, that's just in our DNA. So I'm confident. I'm confident that if we each play our role, government, private sector, and individual Canadians, we can be more prepared and more resilient together. And we can come to think of the internet as not a place where threats lurk, but as a place where we can promote digital trade and advance Canada's interests and where Canadians can ultimately, confidently, and safely live and work online. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Great. Thank you very much for that, Chief. Um, it was an insightful set of remarks, and I really appreciated a number of the points that you made. There's, there's one piece that I, I do want to pick up on kind of right away here, and this is this broad notion of the private sector. Um, the private sector, you mentioned uh, laboratories and testing. I've, you know, there's lots of public reporting on, on co corporations, even universities. And so when I was thinking about this, obviously the CSE, you know, you had, you had a secret mandate and, you know, briefing up through classified channels in government uh, is, is one thing, but how do you actually th then share threat information with non-government partners that aren't security cleared when kind of that secret security kind of piece of the puzzle was the way the organization was structured, but now given the threats that we're facing, you know, it's the private sector that's at the front line. So how do you go about sharing that threat information with, with non-government partners? It's a really good question. And, you know, we often say that CSE is not a secret organization, but we're an organization with secrets. And so it's incumbent on us because of the investment and, and the mandate that we have to take those secrets and to make sure that we are distilling that information and providing it as broadly as we can for the benefit of Canada across the board. How we do that, though, depends on what we're, what we're sharing and with whom. Think if you started at the macro level, probably the, the most obvious example is the National Cyber Threat Assessment, but we also have the Threats to Democratic Processes publications that we've put out, as well as reports that are generally directed at specific sectors, like the health sector or the energy sector. So we do distill and um, format our intelligence with other information in a way that make sure that those threat assessments are the most informed and the most robust information that, that we can offer. And, you know, obviously those are published on our website and we, we advertise them through social media. Um, when people read those publications, it's, it's there that they'll start to understand the risks that they may have in their own specific environments. And so then we can focus on the website and the specific technical advice and guidance that we give. Everything from ransomware and how to deal with that, to supply chain, to how to properly zone technology. It's important that we don't just scare people, but that we also give them practical advice and guidance on how to deal with some of these threats. We do share our threat feed directly with some Canadian groups. Um, we also share with the cyber Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange, and I mentioned CIRA earlier in terms of Canadian Shield. So these uh, feeds are incorporated into their products and services. So Canadians may not even know that they're getting advant taking advantage of our, our information because it's broadcast through, through their services. We also provide focused alerts and um, advisories. Sector-specific roundtables are also convened for specific issues. For example, in the recent colonial instance in the states, we were able to provide technical indicators of compromise to the energy sector quite quickly so that they could take advantage of that information and um, bolster their own security or at least be alert to what the signs of exploitation might look like. And that also happened during COVID. Uh, throughout that last year and a bit, we've been able to share with the health sector many of these kinds of technical indicators and compromises. And of course, a lot of that 
threat information and what to do about it is distilled even into the public guidance we give Canadians on their very best practices, what simple measures they might be able to take that will have a very great return on investment for them in terms of their own personal cyber hygiene and cybersecurity. So from the very macro level down to the top tips to, uh, to Canadians, uh, it's now something that is not, it's very natural for us to try and incorporate that into our day-to-day -day routines to make sure that everything we are telling Canadians and Canadian businesses is informed by as much classified information as we can. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate because, you know, obviously um, corporations are dealing with this, this new world where they're the targets of, uh, of um, state, state actors and it must be uh, complicated to try and run a company in, in that, that threat environment. So I appreciate the various um, uh, mechanisms that you're using to reach out to those critical stakeholders. I wanted to also pick up on something that you'd mentioned about attribution and um, you know putting my cards on the table I've previously written on this issue and I'd argued that at, uh, attributing a, a cyber attack is a legal technical and political calculation um, but I wanted to, to, to ask you about that um, and so to, to, to deciding to attribute or not is, is complex and so how does CSE actually determine whether or not to attribute a cyber attack or a malicious cyber behavior to a state actor what, what process do you go through to do that so it's a very good question um, I think many of the points you've raised are, are very valid <clears throat> and if we think about we often talk, talk about cyber as being a team sport and attribution is also one of those aspects of, of team that come to play. We have a framework within the government of Canada for deciding whether and how to make decisions around attribution. It really draws on the broader stakeholder group within the security and intelligence community. But it comes down to two basic questions. The first is, can we attribute? And the second one is, should we attribute? On the first order, can we attribute, we look at what we know about the actual incident, the actors behind the incident, the motivation behind the incident, and that really is a technical attribution which comes down to CSE as the lead uh, in that part of the process. The second part around should we attribute, this is really about assessing whether or not the activity is counter normative or whether it is in other ways irresponsible cyber behavior, whether there are other measures that the government might want to take instead of or in addition to the actual attribution. And this falls to the global affairs team at uh, in Ottawa as well. So the government takes all of the information available to it and uh, decides whether or not the attribution makes sense at any given time. And the intent here is largely to help shape those norms. We really want to be focusing on the kind of behavior that is considered irresponsible or counter normative. But there's an important byproduct of this process and that's in raising awareness. So if you think about through the pandemic period, we were able to raise alerts, not just when we were specifically attributing cyber irresponsible behavior to specific state actors, but also just in raising the flag so that people could be aware that this kind of activity was happening more generally and take the kinds of precautions to protect their own systems and bolster the security, especially for the health sector and vaccine researchers. So it's really about balancing all of those different uh, considerations and there's probably not one that's identical. It's a very much case by case basis, but it's governed by that framework I discussed. Yeah, uh, understood, and that makes perfect sense, and actually dovetails well with my with my own my own thinking and my own writing on the issue. So, the anytime anytime that uh, as a think tanker, you can have the chief of the CSE agree with your argument, you're doing well. Um, so, I wanted to to come back to this idea of responsibility in cyberspace. Um, obviously, I, you know, I think it's probably safe to say that Canada is a responsible actor, but we're also projecting cyber power. So, how do you balance that? How does how does the CSE in Canada? kind of project cyber power while also then simultaneously respecting international norms and international behavior? Another really good question. Um, you know, it's really interesting that we default, default to militaristic language when we talk about cyberspace. And in thinking about the number of times that we use words like cyber attack or refer to cyber deterrence or a cyber adversary or cyber power, you know, of course, there's a military dimension to cyberspace, and it's important to be cognizant of that. 
But we also have to be careful not to default to thinking of cyberspace as a theater of operations. You know, we're not naive. We don't, uh, we know that nasty stuff happens in cyberspace and we have to deal with the threats and the risks and learn from those incidents and compromises. But it's also important for us to take a real leadership role to help shape cyberspace as that open, secure, inclusive, and uh, safe space where we all want to work and live. So I would say that that leadership role can be in projecting competence and confidence in cyberspace. It can be about taking pragmatic and principled actions. I talked earlier about the best defense being a good defense. Those actions are really, really important to setting the tone and to making sure that we have a strong baseline for, for security. Those actions have to be done in a way that is actor agnostic. You can't specifically defend against a, a, a particular actor. It's about raising the bar across all of those different actor uh, audiences. It's about designing security in upfront. It's about making sure you know what your information the highest priority information you have is what you want to protect and then taking those measures to protect it. It's about knowing who you're inviting into that space, the supply chain for products and services. And it's a knowing what to do when something happens. Resilience is a really big part of this equation and we need to make sure that uh, when, not if something happens, that we are able to resume business and uh, react very quickly. The leadership also needs to take place in the broader global environment. Obviously, we're already working with our allied partners and in multilateral fora to sort of establish these norms that we talked about, creating those guardrails of predictability and stability in cyberspace, and then making sure that we work within them. So we need to be unapologetic about having these authorities and these capabilities to defend ourselves in cyberspace, but we need to make sure that we're walking the talk and using them responsibly in line with the law and also in line with Canadian values. So I think in many ways, cyber power is probably about cyber leadership and stepping up to help shape the environment that we want to see for the world. Um, I want to maybe come back to something that I, I've been thinking about throughout the duration of this, and it's about the change that the organization has, has gone through. Um, and I, I think it's you know safe to say that this year, year and a half, there's been the world has changed immensely. Um, and as I was preparing for this this interview, I note that it that CSE actually turns 75 this year, and, and uh, a shameless plug for CG, it's our 20th anniversary too. So that maybe we'll want to kind of ask you about this. Uh, you know, 75 is is a is a is a big milestone. So I got a two-part question for you. The first is, are, are, how are you planning to mark the milestone, if at all? And then more, more specifically, how have CSE's targets and their, your foreign intelligence reporting priorities changed over the 75 years? You know, back in the day, I, grabbing uh, Soviet radio signals bouncing over the Arctic was, was one set <laughs> of challenges, but obviously we're in a different place now. So if you could comment on those, I'd be, I'd be appreciative. Well, you've made me feel young again by talking about Soviet radio signals over the Arctic. We care a lot about our history at CSE. It's really important to us. And I think looking at, maybe I'll answer the second part of your question first, because looking at the evolution of SIGINT priorities over time, because they represent the interests of the government of the day and are set by the cabinet of the day, this is really a history lesson in itself. So we did have, we predate um, World War II. World War II, for example, um, we were obviously supporting the war effort uh, for the, ca the Canadian and British regimes. We had post-war shifted into a space that represented the really the preoccupations that came with the Cold War and large monolithic targets and issues like mutually assured destruction. So very uh, heavy and <laughs> very important topics of the day. Over the next few decades, the environment shifted a bit more to other geostrategic interests and other threats that were out there. And then by the time we hit 9-11, uh, we were adding terrorism and extremism much more, in a much more prioritized way to other threats like proliferation and espionage. And then today, that brings us right up to the cyber era and seeing how all of those threats and issues are 
intertwined with the cyber agendas out there. So it is uh, it is like taking a, a walk down memory lane is a, a real history lesson, I think, for us all in the, in the SIGINT side. So we have a lot to commemorate, getting to the second part of your question about our 75th anniversary. And we're really starting with our people. So we're focusing on our current employees and the retirees and former chiefs and collecting all of their stories that they're willing to share and uh, compiling them into a publication for the organization. It's, and we're publishing as much as we can on the outside as well. So you'll, if you follow our social media, you'll see a lot of sort of reminiscence and, uh, and interesting stories. We have also got a lot to thank our partners for, whether they're domestic partners or allied partners. A great deal of our success in our history is based on those strong and trusted foundations that we have. We're holding out as well for a party towards the end of the year, uh, COVID pandemic permitting. So um, it's just, we're going to have to adjust, obviously, because of the conditions that the pandemic has uh, put upon us. But we're finding very interesting and uh, satisfying ways to celebrate our history. Well, hopefully that, that party does materialize. Um, uh, and I'll look forward to my invitation. So I, I, I want to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, but I, I do have one more that I wanted to ask. Actually, I've got a, a page of questions that I want to ask because it's not often I get to sit down uh, with the chief of the CSE. But I'll ask one more question off, off of the ones that I wanted to get to. And then I'm going to turn to the questions that are coming in from the audience. But, you know, as I was, as we were talking, it, you know, with the world changing the way that it is, it makes me realize that you really are going to need a diverse uh, workforce, you know, you're and not like diverse in every sense of the the word, like diverse educational background, diverse skill sets, diverse lived experience. Um, but that creates a uh, you know a, a, a distinct suite of issues on the recruiting side. So, how do you actually seek to re recruit a diverse set of employees? How do you ensure that they feel engaged and included in your security and intelligence work? Like, how do you how do you build that in that that environment that you're going to need to to thrive in this this new geopolitical threat landscape? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important focus for us. Obviously, our people are our greatest asset, a diverse and engaged and innovative set of employees is what has got us through the last 75 years. So we, we know that that's our secret sauce. And we want our workforce to be diverse in all ways and to reflect Canada's population in all ways the broadest mix of minds that we can bring to our problems and the broadest set of perspectives are really what has helped us solve some pretty intractable problems over the last uh, seven and a half decades. Now we need that diversity, not just at the working level, but all through the organization, because whether you're working on analysis or assessing risk or setting strategy, it's really important to avoid groupthink, especially in the security and intelligence world. There's a lot of risk there. So we really do invest a lot in trying to find uh, great diversity of, uh, of skills, of uh, talents, backgrounds, um, experiences, and, um, and so far it's been pretty good. We've, we've tried, done some really creative things to help find these kinds of people. Uh, for example, we have a partnership with Escape Room where much of our work is based on puzzle solving, so it's uh, it was an interesting attempt to try and put that right into a fun way to recruit people. And uh, if you made it through the various rooms and solved a bonus puzzle at the end, you would go straight to an interview at CSE. So, you know, you do have to kind of appeal to the the audience that you're looking for, and uh, you know, we're, so we're trying to do many many different uh, things like that. Uh, we're always refining our recruitment efforts. Well, but once we get them, as you point out, the important thing is to keep them and to find ways to make sure that they feel invested in the organization as a community. And we have worked hard to create that kind of healthy workplace and to make sure that people feel like they can have hard and uncomfortable conversations as well, to make sure that we are thinking about others' shared experiences and being the best allies that we possibly can be. We have affinity groups like an LGBTQ2 plus community. We have a black caucus. We have women in cyber and intelligence and other affinity groups that are represented throughout the organization. And we also really encourage people just to talk. So online, people have a lot of opportunity to, to share ideas and resources and just talk about the issues that they're, they're concerned about. 
And we also, not just inside, but we're trying to reach out into the younger populations and the youth of Canada, especially those underrepresented communities of youth with a program that helps us share our passion for STEM. So we work with groups like Hacker Gal and Black Boys Code and Cyber Titan and other local schools to really try and um, raise the interest in STEM. And when we do that, it's important that the people that we send out look like the people that they're talking to, the children that they're talking to. So it's um, it's been a really interesting uh, endeavor, a program that has really had as much benefit for the people inside CSE as for the, the students and the youth that are benefiting from that kind of outreach. Sounds like a, a wide range of, uh, of initiatives underway. On the escape room, uh, that's really neat. I had no idea that you did that. Um, I don't have to worry about getting a job at CSE in that case. I did uh, one of those with my wife prior to the pandemic, and I'd still be locked in there if it wasn't for her. Um, so I, we promised to go to the, uh, to the floor for questions. We see some questions coming in. So I'm, I'm going to turn to the uh, questions from the audience now. Um, and I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, is the private sector, and especially critical infrastructure operators, doing enough in terms of cybersecurity, specifically within the context of the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack last week? So there are lots of different kinds of incidents that are out there. Um, in our national cyber threat assessment from 2020, we made it very clear that cybercrime was on the rise and it would be the most pervasive and most persistent threat to Canadians and Canadian businesses. And we made it clear that they were targeting those organizations that cannot tolerate disruption or that have deep pockets. That global market of talent out there is available for hire and that is a, a, a worrying concern. So are they, what are we doing to help? Um, we're engaging with as many people uh, as we can. We're monitoring that environment. We're sharing the threat information. We're sharing with allies. We are alerting people when we suspect that they may be in the crosshairs of some of these activities. We issue threat bulletins about modern day ransomware. We also put advice out on how to protect yourself in these cases, how to recover from ransomware. We receive calls from the private sector and when we do, um, we are there to help and help in their recovery. And we also issue baseline security controls for small and medium enterprises that can really, you know, basic issue, basic measures that can really help them raise their own bar. So the onus is always going to be on the entity out there to adopt even basic cybersecurity measures will really help reduce the risk of being hit by one of these ransomware attacks. Just patching your systems and updating your operating systems and apps and using strong passphrases and multi-factor authentication. These all sound like fairly routine measures, but they really will go a long way to thwarting the kinds of um, exploitation that's happening out there. And of course, always backing up the data that's important to you and keeping that in a safe place. So we give advice, uh, we give guidance, and we're there to help. Um, it's really just about understanding what the information and services you're trying to protect, making sure there's there is bubble wrapped as possible with cybersecurity measures and having a plan, knowing what to do, what happened wh when something happens, calling the police of jurisdiction, calling the cyber center, making sure that you have a recovery plan. Yeah, no, and your, your point is not lost, I mean, which is that a lot of the times when you see a cyber exploit, it's because somebody didn't have their system patched, right? And it's just, they, they left it they left it sitting wide open. Um, I got a, there's a question coming in on the FedProv divide, and I'm actually glad someone, uh, or the Federal Provincial divide, I'm glad someone raised this. Uh, do you also work with the provinces on their own systems, or are they on their own? How does this coordination work? So, we work with all Canadian partners. Um, we have a federal, provincial, territorial arrangement with the federal government and different sectors and economic departments. So for example, I have been out and Scott Jones, the head of the Cyber Center, has been out at some of these tables in the specific sectors, energy, health, um, transport. And we talk to the provincial leads that are there and help give them the advice and guidance and make sure that they have a connection to the Cyber Center. We've certainly worked with provincial electoral organizations to make sure that they can benefit from the work that we did to support the Canadian elections over the last uh, few years. 
and have all of the good advice and guidance on how to run a safe and secure uh, campaign politically. So the bottom line is yes, absolutely. We work with the provinces. Uh, all the provinces are created a little bit differently in the way that they're structured. And so it's about coming up with the right uh, connections and uh, having a bit of a bespoke arrangement with, with those provinces. Thank you. We have another question coming in uh, about the legislative framework. So would it be your view that there are always improvements to legislation that can be made or is the present legislation more than adequate? So we worked for a long time to refine our legislation. Oh, for the first 50 years of our existence, we operated on a system of orders in council and government uh, cabinet decisions and supported by legal opinions. In 2001, we received the National Defense Act. So between then and now, we've spent a lot of time refining our thinking about how legislation can keep up with technology and the dynamic world that is cyberspace. We only received our legislation two years ago, so we're working through it, we're implementing it now. And uh, at this point, it's allowing us to do the things that we need to do uh, we are looking, though, and if there are any changes or adjustments that we think need to be made, we will definitely be raising them when we come to the review, which happens after the third year. So there's an opportunity to go back and to, to right-size or tweak if we feel that uh, it's not quite hitting the mark in certain areas. But so far, it's allowing us to do some interesting things. Um, our, our next question coming in is it really, it's about the dynamic between cybersecurity and economic prosperity, which is something that I've, I've spoken about quite a bit in the past. And so I'll just read the question verbatim again. Can slash will CSE play an active role in aligning Canada's cybersecurity needs with its economic development opportunities? And then the question goes on you know, as an example, supporting Canada's cybersecurity industry to be a world leader, aligning Canada's quantum strategy. So is there, talk to us a little bit about your views of that interplay or that dynamic interplay between cybersecurity and economic development. That's a very big question. <laughs> so I would start by saying, of course, Canada's economy rides on its digital infrastructure. And so the more we can make that digital infrastructure secure, the, the better. Um, obviously, we work with a wide range of partners in major sectors and critical infrastructure that ride on that, that uh, digital infrastructure and uh, always trying to raise the bar with them. So, uh, and it's a fairly good relationship, I would say, even through the fact that the Cyber Center has only really been in place for, for about two and a half years. Um, just maybe I'll touch on your, your quantum point. You know, we are really focused in at CSE in taking the security insights that we have and trying to share them back out with Canada. So for example, we are really focused on the advent of a cryptologically relevant quantum computer and what that is going to mean in terms of undermining the cryptography that exists today. So we're looking at ways to build quantum resistant algorithms so that, you know, in a post quantum world, we can make sure that there's still security built into our communications and our services. So we're working with, um, we're working with industry, we're working with other levels of government. We're working with uh, the innovation sector as well, trying to make sure that the kinds of innovative thinking that happen within CSE can also be translated outside of CSE, especially in areas like, like quantum. So we have about five minutes left, and there's there's another question coming in, and it is, it's related to intelligence sharing, some of which you touched on, some of which it will be new. So I'll, I'll propose to ask that. Um, and, uh, and then we'll likely have to move toward wrapping up. But the question goes, one of the biggest challenges in the modern world is information sharing uh, and intelligence silos. Um, how does the CSE work to promote information sharing within the Five Eyes nations and within Canada? So we have the benefit of having extremely long-standing and well-established intelligence uh, alliances with our Five Eyes partners. It is a foundation that's built on trust and shared values and priorities, common interests, 
And so I would have to say that the intelligence sharing amongst the Five Eyes is actually uh, robust today. And um, it's always meant to be, uh, we design our activities for our national interests, but there's so much overlap in that common space that it's, it's very easy to find things to share amongst ourselves. The, um, because of the brevity of that answer, we, got, I could, we can squeeze in one more question. You mentioned the CSE's focus on diversity and inclusion. Can you speak more about this? How has CSE worked to overcome some of the stereotypes inherent to the NSI world, or sorry, national security and intelligence world? <laughs> um, you know, CSE has really always had to focus on diversity, not just because it is, as I said earlier, the right thing to do and to be representative for uh, the Canadian population, but it's a mission imperative for us. We have targets that are all over the world. We have challenges that are, are really intractable, and, and we have to bring that multidisciplinary approach to all of that. Um, and and it's interesting because the, the people who are solving those problems are often at the coalface. They're the ones that, that are the broadest representation of our workforce. So it really has helped us over time to have that broad geostrategic global interest uh, to, to deal with. And then, you know, it's just really taken off from there. We have We've tried to institutionalize this as much as possible. We have at CSE a people committee, for example, as part, a major part of our governance, which I share, which I chair. But we also have a an ADM senior official who is responsible for GBA plus uh, gender based analysis plus review of all of our processes and our programs, our information. Um, just yesterday, we hosted an event for the entire security and intelligence community to commemorate the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. And we, we bring in speakers to educate our, our employees so that they can be the most effective allies for the community members that may be from underrepresented groups. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Chief, um, for this fascinating conversation. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been really insightful and, and quite remarkable, and, and thank you um, for, for joining us today. Uh, please join us on June 8th at 1.30 p.m. for a discussion with Vincent Rigby, National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister. Um, I hope you enjoyed this event, and if you would like to watch it again uh, or share it with your colleagues, we'll be posting it on CG's YouTube channel shortly. And, um, you know, Shelley, I'd said the same thing to David Vigneault when we met some weeks ago on this stage. Um, in your line of work, um, you need to be right 100% of the time, and the bad guys only need to be right once. And you also have a job where we cannot publicly celebrate your successes. So I just wanted to pause for a moment and thank you and thank all of your colleagues at CSE for everything that you do to keep Canadians safe in this uncertain time. Uh, please uh, subscribe to CG Online dot, uh, dot, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn uh, to keep up to date on all of our upcoming events and publications. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day and stay safe. Mm -hmm.